So, I'm John Marshall. I'm here at the Giuseppe Art Center. This is my exhibit, uh, Fire Stories. Um, it takes a overview of wildfire and uh, what it's about, the, the good and the bad of it. It looks at things historically. Um, it uh, also looks at what's happening now in modern times with uh, these fires that have gotten bigger, hotter, causing a lot of damage. Um, uh, fire is something that we're all going to have to reckon with, uh, those of us that live in the West. And whether you're a hiker or somebody that just stays in town, it's going to affect you because uh, smoke goes everywhere. Um, for about a century, we tried to eliminate fire, and it's come back to bite us really hard. Uh, and that's where we are now. And uh, this exhibit uh, gives an opportunity to look at this whole thing, uh, starting with how things were way, way back in the day. Um, and a big component of, of the exhibit is um, looking at panoramas taken from fire lookout sites in the 1930s and then going to those same sites today and seeing what has changed and then we talk about well what does the change mean um, I'm coming from both a human perspective and a nature perspective um, I love nature um, my parents took me backpacking in the Wallalas in 1958 when I was uh, seven years old so I've got a long tie to this country, um, but I also understand uh, the whole thing of homes being threatened. And then there's kind of the whole uh, thing of what do we do about this? And um, th there's different factions. Um, uh, there's people that like to see some logging going on. There's some people who don't want to see logging going on. Um, somehow we've got to come to a consensus of how we deal with this wildfire problem. So this is one of only 10 made of the Osborne photo recording transit. And I'm winding up the, uh, the clock motor here. Um, the, the lens actually swung through of the exposure to take the 120 degree view. Um, inside there's a curved rails that hold the film in place. Um, the whole thing uh, with the tripod and the boxes weighs about 75 pounds. And uh, uh, my understanding is that if it was four miles or less, the photographers were expected to pack all of this into the fire lookout sites. If it was more than four miles, they got a pack animal. Uh, so these are pretty rugged individuals that, that did this work back in the 1930s. Um, they went to every fire lookout in Oregon and Washington and took these <clears throat> panoramic photographs, uh, each looking a different direction. Um, it was part of a, a fire suppression program. Uh, the photos were useful in uh, explaining, identifying where uh, fires uh, w were. When you were in a fire lookout, you'd see a smoke and you'd want to be able to describe in words not only the compass bearing, but say something about what drainage or lake or whatever the fire was nearby. And so that was what the purpose of the photos were. But today they provide us with a great record of what our national forests were um, back in the day. And if you think about it, um, 1935 was kind of midway between present day and the time when the Native Americans were still living freely on the land and following their traditional practices, which included lighting a lot of fire. Okay, so this is a section of a, a ponderosa pine tree uh, that was taken from the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest in eastern Washington as part of a U.S. Forest Service research uh, project to get a handle on past fire history. And 
Ponderosa pine is very resilient to fires and um, can survive most fires when it's a mature tree. Uh, and fires leave behind fire scars, uh, which allow scientists to piece together the history. Um, now, this tree started out as a seedling in 1686, and over the next four, uh, excuse me, over the next 200 years, it recorded 14 wildfires. Now, there may have been more fires than that, but there were 14 that left scars behind. Uh, you look at it, we got them 1703, 1720, 1731, 1745, 1759, and so on. Up until 1886, and then no more fires in the next 100 years up to when this uh, specimen was taken. So how is it that we had 14 fires in 200 years and zero fires in the next 100 years? Um, fire suppression really didn't become effective until the 1930s, uh, even though it was started in uh, the early 1900s. Um, but the other aspect to this picture is that Native Americans lit a tremendous amount of fire. And some of these fire scars would represent Native American ignitions. Some of them would represent lightning ignitions. But when the Indian's traditional way of life came to an end, uh, a lot of these fires stopped. And you think about it, 1886, well, it was more like the 1860s that um, the Native Americans were being put on the reservations. So uh, the last uh, fire fairly well correlates with um, removal of Native Americans from the land. And that changed everything from what it had been for the last 10,000 years. This is one of the pairings of Osborne panoramas that I've done. Uh, this is our Buckle Mountain over by Ukiah in the Umatillan National Forest. And this is one of them that I actually did with a drone. Um, because most of the fire lookout towers have been uh, torn down. Um, Forest Service is still very active with fire suppression, but detection of fires is typically with planes these days. Um, so the lookouts aren't used so much, and without the towers, uh, lots of times you go to a fire lookout site and there's not much you can see. But by putting a drone up in the air, I'm able to approximate the same view that was seen from the tower in 1935. Um, and what you see here, uh, if you look in the 1935 photograph, you can see a lot of kind of patchy forest that was caused by um, mixed severity fires uh, happening over time that created different vegetation conditions across the landscape. And then when you don't have fire for uh, almost 90 years, it kind of knits in and uh, the forest becomes more homogenous and also a lot of diseased trees, a lot of dead and down, a lot of fuel. Um, and th this is set up for a really bad fire um, uh, that just wouldn't stop. The other thing about it is that you look at the change in the habitat in the foreground here. If you look at this, this is a mountain big sagebrush habitat. And these, this is an aspen grove. That aspen grove has been swallowed by Douglas fir trees. Uh, it's gone. And so bird species that like to live in an aspen grove have lost uh, their habitat there. And uh, the Douglas fir is pretty much um, encroached on all of the sagebrush area too. If you look into the photo, you can see a few small trees in 1935. So imagine then that all of these little trees grow up to be bigger trees, plus there's more of them, and it all fills in, and you've lost this mountain big sagebrush habitat. So from a biological point of view, this was far more diverse and offered places for more species of wildlife 
than this does. And this is now set to burn in a way that on the wrong day could really wipe the, the slate clean. And, then, and this is where we're at today. Um, you can see in some places where there's been some thinning that's been done. Uh, this was a dense uh, habitat that's been thinned by the Forest Service. And you can see that it's now supporting huckleberries, whereas they would have, there would have been too much shade for the huckleberries uh, to thrive before the thinning was done. Um, we're trying to move in the right direction, but we're really kind of taking baby steps. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why. So the Native Americans obviously had lived on the land um, far, far longer than us. European people, and they understood fire, they understood how to make it useful, they also feared it because um, obviously a fire could kill them, but what they did was they lit a lot of fire. They lit fire in the spring and in the fall, and by burning off the light fields in the shoulder season, it made them more safe during the heat of the summer. The other thing about it is that fire brought them food, not directly, but indirectly, because uh, um, there's only so much you can do with a tree. I mean, if you're desperate, you can gnaw on the bark of a ponderosa pine, but really you'd rather eat berries, roots, salmon, deer, or elk than gnaw on a pine tree. So what fire did is it kept the landscape open, which promoted more food for deer and elk, and it also made uh, camas more abundant. And they would actually burn off the camas fields annually to get rid of the dead uh, material uh, and allow the space for the, the new plants, and that's how they maximized camas production. As you can imagine, the Fire didn't necessarily stop at the edge of the forest or the edge of the, uh, the camas field either. It, it kept going for some distance. Um, so their, their way of dealing with the land was to keep it open and um, to maximize their food production, uh, make it easier to travel through the land, uh, and make them safer during uh, the heat of summer. And obviously, they didn't have the kind of shelters that we have where we've invested our whole life savings in our shelter and don't want to lose it. Um, they could come up with another shelter. It wasn't quite the disaster that it is for us. So obviously, uh, European people had a very different relationship with uh, nature and the land than the Native Americans. And we saw these trees as, as very valuable because uh, we could build our cities out of them. Um, and we, we wanted to protect those trees. We didn't want to lose them. And we didn't understand uh, the role of fire at all. And if you go back to um, the beginnings of the National Forest, uh, Gifford Pinchot and Theodore Roosevelt really made the National Forest possible. But Pincho really sold um, the idea that the Forest Service needed to care for the National Forest because the Forest Service could provide fire protection and fire was seen as a problem, the enemy of the trees. Um, Pincho got his education in France and he picked up the ideas of German forestry and French forestry and seems not to have paid any attention to how Native Americans had handled fire. Um, so our whole idea was we snuff out every fire we can and we see logs like this as being decadent and uh, a material that if, if we don't cut it down it's going to be wasted, rot, whatever. And so we target trees like that. Fortunately, we're not doing that anymore. Uh, we don't have very many trees like this left. And what few we have, we want to save. 
but it's not enough just to protect them from the chainsaws. We also have to protect them from fire, and that has to do with managing the fields around big trees. So this section of the exhibit um, really speaks to fire as a force of nature. And fire, in essence, is a, a combination of biological and physical processes. Biology uh, creates the fields by trapping the energy from the sun and using carbon and oxygen and hydrogen to build cellulose uh, and it stores the sun's energy. What fire does is it releases that stored energy. And fire comes in many, many shapes and forms. It can be smoldering, moving inches per hour, or it can be a raging crown fire that's moving four miles per hour. Uh, and it all has to do with uh, the terrain, uh, the arrangement of the fields, and the weather. And you can get a completely different outcome with the same place, the same fields, depending on whether uh, it's burning it in the day or at night, from the top of the ridge down, from the bottom of the slope up. Um, there's a zillion permutations uh, to fire. And it's, it's incredibly interesting. Um, it's also obviously it can be very dangerous. Um, but uh, I think it's important for people to understand it and understand there's times when fire is going to benefit the forest and there's times when it's not. And when it, it can benefit the forest, we need to be able to let it do its thing. And when it's not going to benefit the forest, we need to snuff it out if we can. So, the fire comes in many flavors. Um, this is a, is a smoldering fire that, that's literally moving centimeters per hour. Um, whereas up here, you see a whole kind of rainbow of effects. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of a, um, what we would call a cold, dry forest in Washington State. Uh, around 6,000 feet elevation east of the Washington Cascades. It's an aerial photograph. And you can see a range of effects here from um, burn so hot that uh, the needles are all burned off the trees, uh, the trees are all dead, to uh, scorch, the trees are still dead, but the needles are, haven't been consumed, to um, not being touched at all. And we like a situation where we get a rainbow of effects because every one of these is going to be a different habitat for animals. Um, rather than see fire is categorically bad, what we really want is to see a range of effects across the landscape and not just burnt black, not just green for miles either, but a, a range of effects. Okay, so. This shows the very early stages of um, the landscape coming back after a fire. Um, this was the Table Mountain fire it burned in fall of 2012 in Washington State. Uh, these were lodgepole pine trees uh, and subalpine fir trees, not unlike what we have around Willow County. That's an Engelman spruce, spruce tree that uprooted. Um, this picture is taken early in the summer following the fire. So this is early 2013. And in just the course of three months, it went from like that to like that. And then I came back two years later and you can see, you can, you can almost not see that spruce tree that fell over. Um, the plants that you see here are mostly fireweed. Fireweed is a, a native plant uh, that's just really, really good at taking advantage of uh, burned areas. It, it, uh, the seeds blow in on the wind, and um, then it just propagates like crazy. Um, the fireweed's temporary. There's um, all kinds of logical pine seedlings come up in this, and I think if we went back now, you'd mostly see logical pine.
So this is a quote from my good friend, uh, Dr. Paul Hesberg, who's a US Forest Service research scientist. And Paul says, fire is the very heartbeat of the ecosystem. Paul will also tell you that we're, fire's having arrhythmia right now, uh, that it's, the heartbeat is, is, is off. But what Paul means is that fire coming at the right kind of timing creates all these habitats from which all of these different life forms spring. Um, say this habitat of these burned trees is, is great for the blackback woodpecker for a few years. Um, on the other hand, a animal like a moose uh, will benefit uh, some years later when willows grow back um, after a fire. Uh, a bluebird is going to follow the woodpeckers and, and use their nest holes. Um, uh, elk are going to do best in open country where there's grasses, sedges, and brush. Some trees are nice, but uh, not too many uh, for optimum elk habitat. Um, golden eagles uh, are tied to the animals they eat, amongst them being deer. Um, they're not generally known for killing deer, but they're great at uh, finding dead ones. Uh, and so what happens, the fate of the deer affects the eagles. Um, fish are, are very tied in with fire. And the fish story is that initially, fires can raise havoc with fish with uh, uh, flooding and debris flows and mud and all that. On the other hand, uh, those debris flows uh, leave fresh spawning gravel that when it all clears up, it's better than it was before. Uh, plus bringing in logs and stuff for the fish to hide under. So the fish are actually tied in with the fire cycles. So fire, the very heartbeat of the ecosystem. So these are some photo series, we call them photo point series that I initiated back in 1994 in Washington State after a particularly bad fire season. And I wanted to people to understand uh, how um, fire is as much a starting point in the forest as an ending point and again, how these amazing changes would, would roll out in the vegetation. So these series represent 25 years of change, starting with uh, being severely burned and then changing over time. And from a biological point of view, uh, each condition that you see benefits some species at some point in its, its life cycle. So I wanted people to understand that the forest wasn't just destroyed forever, the land wasn't just destroyed, that it was really the start of a journey. Uh, and there were all these amazing things that were gonna happen along the way. So fire can be our friend or our enemy. And by trying to eliminate fire, we have brought far worse fire onto ourselves. And as I said earlier, fire can be great biologically. It can also be very destructive biologically. Uh, and when you see uh, situations like this, where it's nothing but toothpicks for uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of acres uh, with no green trees in between, that is not a good situation. And we're getting more and more of that kind of thing. And it's two things happening at the same time. One, the buildup of fields and the continuity of trees on the landscape. Two, climate change. Climate change is real. We're getting uh, longer fire seasons, hotter, drier summers, more extreme weather. And the most extreme burning happens during extreme weather, uh, low humidity, winds, uh, unstable atmospheres, and uh, left and right, we are getting horrible situations, horrible outcomes, uh, not just people's homes, but what's happening to nature also. 
So, we cannot de deny that fire is happening uh, in a big way and a destructive way. And so, what do we do about it? Uh, and as a, as a people, as a society, we need to come together on this. Um, so, there's different opinions out there, but my opinion is that besides allowing some fires to burn under some situations, it also would be help to do, helpful to do some logging, but not logging just to get logs, but logging in such a way that is thoughtful and leaves the forest in a better condition than it was before we logged. Um, if we end up with a forest where trees are spaced out and limbed up, it's pretty hard for the fire to destroy that. Um, the, the challenge is uh, how to pay for itself, how to get enough logs to um, uh, provide the funds to make this happen. Um, and there's different opinions about this. Obviously, some people um, have a negative reaction to logging on the public lands. And considering what's happened in the past, it's no wonder why. But what I like to say is that doing nothing uh, is uh, ensuring destruction. Uh, doing something may have some problems, will have some problems, but at the end of the day, we're left with some green trees. And um, this is something that we've got to work out. So this is an example of a logging operation that I really like. Um, this is a Sinlihican wildlife area in Washington State. And it started out with a forest way, way too thick due to 100 years of fire suppression. And back in the day, what would have happened is the loggers would have taken that tree and that tree and that tree and that tree and left all this. Instead, they've done just the opposite here. They've left the bigger trees. These are ponderosa pines. They've taken out the smaller trees some of which made money, some of which actually cost more to remove than they got in revenue. Then they did prescribed fire. They went in with brick torches and lit this. And so now it's gone from this to that. It's ready for a wildfire. And guess what? They got a wildfire. And you can see it did no harm. If that wildfire had burned in this condition, um, there would be none of these Douglas fir trees alive and it might have killed these ponderosa pines as well. And what I tell people is, if they care about these old growth ponderosa pine trees, they better be thinking about eliminating these thickets around them because they're going away if we don't do something.